Hello everyone, it's Will here from Singletrack Magazine and singletrackworld.com and here I have a brand new full suspension bike from Pivot Cycles. This is the new Mach 4 SL. Now this is a brand new bike, but it is an amalgamation of two existing pivot models. It replaces the Mach 429 SL and the Mach 4 Carbon. It is Pivot's lightweight full suspension cross country bike. So of course we have a full carbon fiber frame and 100 millimeters of travel on the back via the DW Link suspension design. As you'll be able to tell, the orientation is a little bit different to the previous Mach 429 SL. The rear shock has now been flipped into a vertical position and this is all about packaging. It's all about increasing standover clearance while still providing room for a water bottle inside the mainframe. Now the Mach 4 SL will come in a full range of sizes and that includes an extra small size all the way up to an extra large size. It will only come with 29 inch wheels however, there will be no 27.5 inch version. Now this is part of the reason why we have this new shock orientation. The whole idea is to get the frame nice and low so even in that extra small frame size, there's still room for a large size water bottle inside the mainframe. Perhaps more impressive though, is that the standover clearance on the extra small size is greater than what we found on the previous 27.5 inch Mach 4 Carbon in the same extra small size. That's really impressive. As you'll be able to tell, this bike has less of the swoopy aesthetic of the Mach 429 SL. The tubes are a lot straighter and they're much smaller diameter as well. Aside from giving it a really good look, I think this is one of Pivot's best looking bikes. It also helps to reduce weight. So according to Pivot, this frame has dropped around 300 grams over the previous 429 SL. This bike is one by specific, so there's no provision for a front derailleur at all. That's allowed Pivot to lift up the chain stays, so they take a more direct route from the rear axle to the lower DW Link Pivot. And that is all about reducing weight while still maintaining the stiffness of the previous bike. You'll also notice that the swing arm now has double uprights. And again, this is all about stiffness and because the frame doesn't have to take a front derailleur or a double chain ring, there's more room to play with there for Pivot's engineers. Another nice feature on this frame is it does have a relatively straight seat tube, so there's plenty of insertion depth, and that helps maximize the amount of travel you can fit with a dropper post. Now up front, the Mach 4 SL will take between 100 to 120 millimeters of fork travel. There'll be a range of different build kits available with either of those two options. The World Cup version, which comes with a 100 millimeter travel Fox 32 step cast fork and a very lightweight build kit, weighs just 9.47 kilos. So very, very lightweight for a full suspension race bike. The bike I've got here is a more trail oriented build kit. So we have a Fox 34 step cast fork on the front with 120 millimeters of travel. We've got a Fox transfer dropper post on here as well. This bike here in the medium size without pedals weighs 11.37 kilograms. Now, as you'll be able to tell, this bike has a very high-end build kit. We have a Shimano XTR drivetrain, XTR brakes, Raceface Next SL cranks on here too, Fox Factory Kashima suspension package, and carbon fiber wheels from DT Swiss, so very lightweight very high-end bike. As a result, the sticker price is very high. In the UK, this bike is gonna retail for over 10,000 pounds. And in Australia, you'll get a buck change from $16,000. So very, very high-end. Now, part of the reason for that is we do have the Fox Live Valve upgrade on this bike. More about that in a little bit though. In terms of geometry, this bike is quite progressive for a short travel cross-country bike. With the 120 millimeter travel fork on the front, we have a 67.5 degree head angle and a 73.5 degree effective seat tube angle. And I should point out that both the seat angle and the head angle will steepen by one degree when you drop the fork down to 100 millimeters of travel. The fork is using a 44 millimeter offset, which is a little shorter than the traditional 51 millimeter offset. The chainstay length on this bike has been kept relatively short at 400 31 millimeters and the bottom bracket sits 334 millimeters off the floor. In terms of reach measurements, the Mach 4 SL basically follows the existing Trail 429. Now I should point out here that the reach does change depending on whether you're running the 120 or 100 millimeter travel fork. For the medium size that I've been testing here, the reach is 427 millimeters with the bigger travel fork. 
When you drop that fork down to 100 millimeters though, the reach extends to 440 millimeters, which is pretty roomy for a cross country race bike. Other features on this bike, we have ISCG 05 chain guide tabs. We don't have all three bolt holes though, we've just got two, and that's designed to allow you to fit a lightweight upper guide, something that cross country racers will appreciate, no doubt. Something else that racers will appreciate is the fact that there's clearance for up to a 38 tooth chain ring. The bike that I've got here has a 34 tooth chain ring, and that's matched to Shimano's 10 to 51 XTR cassette out back. But for much more powerful cross country racers who want a really tall gear, there is Room to run up to a 38 tooth here. Of course we have boost hub spacing front and rear with tidy bolt up axles which keep the width nice and narrow. Speaking of, the swing arm on the back is kept relatively slim but there's still clearance for up to 2.5 inch tyres in the back end of this bike. On the bike that I've been riding here we've got Maxxis Ardents in a 2.2 inch width and there's loads of clearance through the upper seat stays and down through the chainstay area as well. Also nice is a neat little rubber cover which sits over the top of the lower DW link and that's just to keep mud, rocks and dirt from kind of getting down in there between the carbon fibre swing arm and the linkage. Of course we have internal cable routing on this bike too and all of the entry and exit points have tidy bolt up port covers which does make routing a cable through and out the frame a lot easier. Right, so on to the important stuff. How does this bike ride? Well, I've been riding this bike for the last three days. We've been invited out here to Fruta in Colorado by Pivot Cycles to test out the new Mach 4 SL. We've ridden the 18 Road Trail Network and the Cocopelli Trail Network. And today we actually took part in a local race at Grand Junction as part of the Epic Ride series. Perhaps a little bit ambitiously, I decided to take part in the 40 mile category, which roughly works out to be about 65 kilometers or so. In total, I've spent about 130 kilometers of riding on this bike, so I'm getting a really good feel for how it performs on the trail. Now, in terms of setup, this medium fits me really well. I stand at 175 centimeters tall, and the only thing I've changed has been to go to a slightly shorter stem. The medium will normally come with a 70 millimeter long stem. I've gone for a 60, and that's mated to 740 millimeter wide riser bars. However, these bars come fitted with the WTB padlock grips. These actually add a little bit of extra width. In total, you're talking about 755 millimeters from end to end. Getting the suspension set up with the Fox Live Valve system does feel a bit intimidating, but it's actually relatively simple. For a start, you can turn the whole system off, and that's how you want to set up your sag with the fork and the rear shock. Up front in the Fox 34 Stepcast fork, I'm running about 80 PSI. In the rear shock, I'm running about 175 PSI. Of note on rear shock setup, Pivot actually includes a neat little sag indicator which clips onto the shock body. It's cable tied on there, so it does stay on the bike. It, it's not going to fall off on the trail and it just makes setup a lot easier. You don't have to get the ruler out to measure sag on the rear shock. The only thing I would say about the Fox Live Valve shock is adjusting rebound is quite tricky. You have to use a tiny little Allen key right down the bottom of the shock to access the dial and twist that left or right to add or subtract rebound damping. If you're not familiar with the Fox Live Valve system, the easiest way to describe this is an automated suspension adjustment system. There are various sensors on the front and the back of the bike and these are measuring both bump force impacts. The idea is that when the computer senses those impacts, it will determine whether it wants to open or close the fork and the rear shock. Now the open mode is quite plush. It's a really nice, smooth, fluid, open setting. The closed mode isn't quite a full lockout, but it is quite a firm setting. Now how firm that setting is, is already predetermined by Pivot and Fox during the setup of this bike. The open mode though is adjustable. There's a little Allen key that you can adjust on the top of the fork and down at the rear shock and you can make that setting firmer if you so choose. Both Fox and Pivot recommend leaving that wide open though and the idea is that the suspension will be nice and firm on smoother terrain when you do hit rocky technical trails it'll open up and you'll get that nice smooth action in the open mode. Now on the live valve controller, you can toggle between five different settings for sensitivity. One being the most sensitive, as in the suspension is more likely to open up into that fluid open mode more easily. Five being the firmer setting, so it will stay locked out for longer. In that setting five, it is really firm and it takes quite a big impact for the fork and the shock to open up. 
in position one, it's really sensitive. You still get a firm feeling when you're pedaling along on smooth single track and on bitumen or, or on smooth fire roads, but it does open up relatively quickly. Now today for the race, I ran the live valve setting in number two. So not quite the most sensitive and slightly firmer setting and it proved to be perfect for this kind of cross country marathon racing style where you are transitioning from bitumen sections to fire road to smooth climbs to technical climbs to technical descents as well. The way the system reacts is very, very fast. It's very impressive. That said, this suspension design is already very efficient. I did turn off the live valve system. It's possible to run this bike with the live valve switched off completely. And the bike does pedal really, really well. The main difference is when you get out of the saddle, you are gonna get suspension compression from both the fork and the rear shock. When you've got live valve switched on though, you're gonna get a much firmer responsive feeling. So you'll have more of your pedal power going to the rear wheel. In general, I'd say this is a more useful tool for cross-country races and cross-country marathon races as well. For trail riders, having that automated suspension control is going to be less of an advantage. And the good news is this Fox Live Valve system is an optional upgrade. So if you don't want to go with that electronic suspension control, you don't have to. You can run this bike with the full analog system. And as I said, it does pedal very, very well already with this DW Link suspension design. Probably the best trait of this bike, though, is its technical hand handling up front with that slack head angle and the reduced offset fork. This bike feels really planted on the descents. And some of the trails I've been riding have been really rocky and really rowdy. To be honest, I would have initially preferred to be on a, a longer travel, a 130, 140, 150 millimeter travel bike, but we've gotten away with a lot on this thing. And a lot of that has to do with that planted front end and really high quality suspension design. Particularly in the race today, I was on trails that I've never ridden before. A lot of blind kind of drop offs, big kind of rocky ledges, um, sketchy exposed corners, and there was no situation on this bike where I felt uncomfortable. I got away with a lot on this bike and certainly a lot more than what I'd expect for a really lightweight cross-country full suspension bike. I would be really interested to try this out with the shorter travel fork in the full cross-country race mode, but as it stands, I think this is kind of the cross-country bike that most people should probably be on. It's really stable, it's really confidence inspiring, the quality of the suspension is fantastic. Even though I was hitting full travel regularly, I I rarely ever felt the bottom out from the rear shock. There's plenty of progression at the end of the stroke and certainly on some of the bigger drop-offs we've been hitting over the last couple of days, that's been really beneficial for sure. So there you go, that's my first impressions of the new Pivot Mark IV SL. Now I've got a detailed ride report on singletrackworld.com, so make sure you head to the website to read more about this bike. Now if you've got any questions for me about the Mark IV SL, make sure you drop them into the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up, and if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for plenty more video reviews coming your way. Otherwise, that's it from me guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Toorou!